So a uh, good one. Uh, a clinical overview of low and intermediate risk neoblastoma with an emphasis uh, of, of the genomic aspect. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Andy, for the introduction. And I would like to speak to you about treatment on low and intermediate risk neuroblastoma, where we are today, and what, are the way, what is the way forward. The fact that not so many talks here at this meeting have focused on these patient populations does not mean, I think, that there are not any remaining questions. And I would like to highlight briefly what those remaining questions might be and how to approach them. So um, we all agree that in the treatment of neuroblastoma, there is a vast spectrum, in fact, of possibilities with treatment that can go from observation only to a whole arsenal of all the treatments that we have available today. And when we look at the evolution of outcome of our patients, a very nice publication some years ago showed that indeed um, overall and um, event-free survival has increased over the last decades. However, we clearly see that this improvement in outcome has really been um, uh, for patients with low and intermediate risk disease. I think this is really a major element to show how um, integration of a new um, risk stratification can help to improve outcome in our patient population. So we have already heard how the INRG has been instrumental to the definition of pretreatment classification schema and how um, this pretreatment classification schema is really so important so that we know what we are talking about. And I will be addressing the patient populations which are termed very low risk, low risk and intermediate risk. So patients who have really an excellent or good um, inventory and overall survival. And in these patient populations, the treatments that can be considered, again, go from observation only to surgery to intermediate dose chemotherapy. And I would like to highlight in the next few minutes how it is so important to fine tune treatment intensity for these patients. So the first patient um, population I would like to think about together with you is the, are the patients with what we term neonatal adrenal masses. So we often, we, we sometimes have patients for whom an adrenal mass has been diagnosed either antenatally or postnatally. And we know today that in some instances it is not necessary to have a definitive diagnosis of neuroblastoma in these patients. Several um, collaborative groups have in fact opted for an attitude of observation only without any um, histological proof of uh, the disease, meaning that this uh, mass might be presumed to be neuroblastoma with a differential diagnosis of different diseases such as an adrenal hemorrhage or other um, um, phenomena. The different collaborative groups have proposed an observational attitude in these infants with different age cutoffs that may be, still need to be discussed further that can go to three months or a later age. Um, however, of course, there are radiological criteria for patients to fit into this observational attitude. And um, it might be of importance to consider that in these uh, situations, um, liquid biopsies might be important at least to enable the study of MCN status when no um, biopsy has been performed. Moving on to low-risk neuroblastoma, being patients with localized uh, resectable disease, um, localized unresectable disease under 18 months, or stage MS disease, um, again, the treatment can be very minimal. Localized resectable neuroblastoma has been shown to be curable with surgery only, and different um, collaborative um, efforts have uh, demonstrated this. Um, the localized neuroblastoma European study showed indeed an excellent um, relapse-free survival and overall survival in these patient cohorts. And finally also uh, noted the importance of the definition of image-defined risk factors to have a more um, comprehensive and um, overall view of when surgery should be um, performed versus um, risk uh, related to surgery in these uh, patients. The impact of biological features in these um, cohorts um, needs to be studied further to highlight the risk of relapse in a small subpopulation of patients. Infants with localized unresectable disease or MS disease um, have been studied in terms of survival in the European INAS trials, again showing excellent overall and event-free um, survival. And um, when we go on to look at what happens to these tumors, an interesting study by um, Hero and colleagues had demonstrated that some 
patients indeed have regression of their localized neuroblastoma without any treatment. Out of 93 patients, spontaneous regression was seen in 44 of them. And the question is how to define the population that can be safely observed. And here I would like to take a step back and think about prognostic factors that can be added. And what we had looked at uh, particularly is the genomic profile and how the genomic profile of the tumor can contribute to risk stratification. Um, array CGH in neuroblastoma has been performed in several series of patients, and it is important to highlight that the general classification can then improve a prognostic information. And the most commonly used classification now goes back to this publication by my coworkers, where we had distinguished numerical chromosome alterations, meaning gains and losses only of whole chromosomes versus segmental chromosome alterations with chromosome arms gained or lost are lost, and we could see a clear difference in terms of progression-free and overall survival in these, between these um, different uh, genomic groups. This has also been demonstrated in other patient series, including the large INRG database, where we can see um, a big difference between patients with no versus segmental um, chromosome alterations. And, um, when we move on to the treatment of infants, how can this information then be integrated? We looked at the array CGH profile of infants included in the European trials, and we could there again see that patients with numerical chromosome alterations had a much better um, event-free survival than those with segmental chromosome alterations. And this led to the construction of our um, European trial um, term, DELINES, where we integrate the information of array CGH into um, a global risk uh, uh, stratification to then adapt a therapy. The challenge of this is to realize um, array CGH or genomic profiling in a prospective setting in real time in multinational trials. The classification that we use is um, the one I mentioned earlier. We distinguish numerical chromosome alterations, meaning no breakpoints seen on any of the chromosomes, versus segmental chromosome alterations, breakpoints seen on the recurrently <coughs> altered alterations in neuroblastoma. And there are also patients where we do not give a result because we cannot classify the profiles, as in this case where we see an alteration where we do not know if this is of prognostic significance in our patient population or not. So the treatment um, stratification becomes more complicated. This is an example of the Linus trial. Patients aged less than 18 months, of course, no mechan amplification, localized unresectable disease. We need to, of course, uh, see whether there are any life-threatening symptoms. In the absence of life-threatening symptoms, the genomic profile is taken into account. In the absence of segmental chromosome alterations, this prospective trial randomizes between observation only and the standard chemotherapy arm. COG is running a similar trial with um, a stratified uh, treatment according to response and biology based on copy number profiling. Moving on to intermediate risk neuroblastoma, generally considering um, patients with um, stage um, L2, so unresectable tumors aged more than 18 months. Um, an important population had shown that in some of these patients, a treatment with reduced chemotherapy might be um, possible. For these patients um, in the, the publication by Bakers, um, treatment was adapted between four to eight courses of chemotherapy and um, with the commonly used uh, chemotherapy drug drugs and treatment adapted according to the biological favor, uh, features, taking into account histological characterization and the uh, DNA index. And, we, and um, uh, generally, a um, um, good outcome was uh, reported for these patients. Um, in a European uh, corresponding study focusing on uh, patients with a localized unresectable neuroblastoma, six courses of chemotherapy were proposed. Um, and um, as well as surgery. And in this population, EFS was 76% um, with um, and prognostic impact of the histology um, being reported because when uh, the outcome um, was compared between those with favorable versus unfavorable um, histology, a clear difference was seen. In this population also, the genomic copy number alterations are of prognostic impact. In a recent publication, the distribution of segmental chromosome alterations could be seen with um, more frequent segmental chromosome alterations in the older patients. And 
amongst the patients aged over 18 months a prognostic impact of the presence of segmental alterations in this patient population. So the big question is, um, that is not resolved is what do we, how do we consider patients with L2 disease over 18 months? Are they intermediate or are they high risk? Uh, Julie Park mentioned this morning that um, for some of these patients, they are indeed um, high risk patients. Um, I have summarized again some of the observations that, that, um, uh, that take um, into account the survival of the different cohorts with an event-free survival of these patients um, between um, 70 um, around 70%. I think um, that uh, this is still an outstanding question and that further study of these um, patients, including their tumor, um, uh, will um, inform more about the necessary treatment strategy. Um, but for a large number of these patients, um, we need to move towards high-risk uh, strategies such as proposed um, in some um, treatment trials currently. I would like to um, mention briefly some other um, associated um, diseases that I think are of importance in the context of low and intermediate risk disease because they might um, inform on the general genomic context and also um, on the treatment um, that might be um, associated. Opsoclonus myoclonus syndrome is a rare syndrome, as you know, a paraneoplastic syndrome which associates opsoclonus myoclonus and ataxia as well as behavioral abnormalities. And whereas the oncological outcome is excellent, these patients have poor neurological outcome. And it is postulated that there is an underlying autoimmune mechanism, which is why immunosuppressive treatments are proposed, which currently are um, ma mainly um, high-dose steroids, cyclophosphamide, rituximab, as well as in severe cases, immunomodulatory agents, and uh, sometimes going on to plasmapheresis. A recent um, COG randomized study showed that there's a significantly higher rate of um, resolution of OMS symptoms when IVIG is added. That was reported at the ANR meeting two years ago. And a collaborative study is on, currently ongoing um, in Europe where we follow a three-step treatment approach using dexamethasone, cyclophosphamide, and rituximab. Um, the open question is, what do we do with this immunotherapy in the rare patients who have OMS in a high-risk setting? Are these patients actually eligible for the immunotherapy that we consider necessary for high-risk disease. Um, another specific clinical situation is um, the situation of spinal cord compression, which occurs in 5 to 10 percent of all neuroblastoma patients and, of course, consists of a medical emergency. Immediate treatment must be given, as we all learn during our residency, um, to increase the chances of neurologic recovery, especially when symptoms are present. The treatment options are, of course, steroids, chemotherapy, um, and um, what it becomes clear is that um, um, although many investigators may have preferred a chemotherapy approach recently, the importance of multidisciplinary discussions can only be stressed in order to enable decisions aiming to decrease um, other um, long-term sequelae. And in this um, context, the importance of registries recording the, these um, um, phenomena can only be um, stressed. So what about residual disease? We all know that in terms of a surgery, often we have some um, remaining tumor tissue. And I think that is one of the questions that we will need to address in future trials. The um, development of imaging um, um, and especially the advent of SPECT MIBG uh, might be of importance when evaluating local residual disease and future studies are needed to determine the role of active versus non-active residual disease perhaps linking this again to the genomics of the tumor. So when considering the treatment of low and intermediate risk neuroblastoma, I think it is really crucial to be able to fine tune the treatment intensity and the duration based on tumor characteristics, as I tried to highlight, epigenetic and genetic features, and also maybe on any residual mass and minimal residual disease, as well as host characteristics. So are there any newly identified therapeutic targets that might be of prognostic significance in these patient groups? Um, as mentioned in a talk earlier, a number of um, targetable alterations have been um, um, uh, 
evidenced recently, and I would, since they were um, addressed in detail in a previous um, talk, I would just like to highlight some of them again. We have heard about the third rearrangements, which were reported by two separate teams and were shown to be of prognostic impact. A very nice abstract presented here in this meeting indicated that also in seven patients with intermediate risk neuroblastoma, a third um, rearrangement could be evidenced. Given that the outcome of these patients appears to be similar to that of patients with MIGEN amplification, I suppose one of the future questions will be whether we need to treat these patients as other high-risk patients or not, and future trials will be um, necessary to, to um, analyze this. We also heard about the alterations of ATRX with mutations or deletions occurring in neuroblastoma samples, probably more frequent in the adolescent and younger adult group, with probably also links to the outcome and these patients most frequently showing a more indolent course. So I think in this patient population, the thought of a maintenance therapy will be more relevant. Likewise, other alterations in chromatin remodeling genes have been reported um, with, um, an, in a study reported here by some of my collaborators, um, an incidence of over 10% of samples harboring alterations in any chromatin remodeling gene, the most frequent of which are arid, the arid genes MLL2 or ATRX. And maybe new therapeutic approaches targeting these alterations might also be of interest in these patient populations. Finally, thinking about the relapse and where these cells might come from, it might be of more importance to more evaluate more in detail minimal residual disease. And this can be done by two means, either based on RT-PCR targeting mRNA transcripts, such as been published by uh, several groups, and um, a recent publication indeed showed the prognostic impact of the um, documentation of mRNA transcripts, either at the time of diagnosis or later on in treatment. This minimum residual disease might also be based on the detection of translocations, as reported, and based on the identification of breakpoints on um, whole genome sequencing data, and then the search of these translocation and peripheral samples. I think that in this context, the study of cell-free DNA is really crucial. And we do not know yet if the study of cell-free DNA is actually representative of a tumor and whether it can be used for monitoring of tumor burden. In a study um, presented here by some of my collaborators, we show that we can use cell-free DNA to indeed obtain a genomic copy number profile, and we will need to study these techniques further to document their usefulness for tumor monitoring and the evolution of genomic profiles in this context. So I would like to conclude by saying that uh, the treatment of low-risk and intermediate-risk neuroblastoma has indeed permitted to um, increase the survival of these patients, but I think we can move ahead by further fine-tuning these treatments in terms of treatment burning, burden, the treatment intensity, and the duration of treatment by further integrating biological information into our treatment schemas. Thank you very much. <laughs>